that was funny. Yeah, she gave us a ride. Good morning. I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to this time of worship and pray that the Holy Spirit will touch our hearts together as we uh, gather here or online uh, with the same invitation and the same spirit of God bringing us uh, to, this, to this time. Today, um, I'm grateful that we have uh, a group of children who are willing and interested in doing a Christmas pageant for us. And so they are gonna start practicing next Sunday. I'm very excited and I think two of them are sitting there. Oh no, also Rometto is part of it too, and Isaias. And so we're very happy about that. If you know of any children uh, who would, or youth who would be interested in this, uh, they will be gathering next Sunday. Uh, um, Cheryl, what time are we? Two o'clock, two to three. So it's just like seven practices and the, the performance or the pageant will be on the 16th of December. So uh, I am very excited about that and grateful to God for the children, their families being willing to invest the time. And hopefully it will be a blessing for us this Christmas season. Uh, today is the last official Sunday of uh, this sermon series, Our World and Stories. I know next Sunday I will be attending a workshop uh, and so I have a guest preacher coming, Daniel Calkins. I met him through the Youth Bureau. He will be here, but he's also reading this, this book by Mark Iaconale that we've been using for the sermon series. So I'm not sure what he's gonna be preaching on exactly, but he will be kind of picking up the same theme. So I hope you will come and uh, participate. Uh, I know you all just love me so much. No, <laughs> I have no illusion, but uh, I do know that the Holy Spirit is working through Daniel uh, and he's been praying about it and, and excited to share. Uh, his story is really interesting uh, about, he, he went to seminary, he wanted to be ordained uh, in uh, the free Methodist tradition, uh, but then they had to ask him to sign a statement saying that he would, not, he would uh, be in disagreement with same-sex marriage. And he couldn't, with good conscience, uh, s sign the statement. And some people told him, you know, you just sign it and you don't have to believe it. But his integrity was too much for that, so he didn't get ordained as a result. And so he's worked other jobs, so uh, I, I'm glad that maybe our church will help him also reclaim that part of his uh, calling, his to ministry, to serve, to preach uh, the word to others. Uh, so today with thinking of this theme uh, and ending it, I was like, hmm, how do we end this? We've been talking about stories. And uh, the theme for today is about looking at which stories we live by. Uh, thinking of uh, stories that separate us from others or stories that bring us together. And or se sometimes the stories separate us from our own selves. If you've ever had that experience in your own life where um, you know the stories you tell about yourself. I was, uh, last week we were with family members and we had a 12 year old in the house and I got a chance to talk to him about his life and what he thinks and it was really interesting uh, that you know there was this sense of he didn't realize how brilliant he is and didn't realize how amazing he is. Always said something negative about himself. Whenever he did something wrong, oh, I'm so stupid. And this kid is incredibly smart. And it just reminded me of this whole thing of seeing ourselves as God sees us, seeing others as God sees them, seeing others for, for who they are, brilliantly made in God's image. And it's a hard thing to do because most of the time the inner stories are very negative and we're not even aware of them. Mark Iaconelli says this, are we living by stories that separate us from each other or stories that bring us together and remind us that we are connected to God, to each other and to all creation, all of creation. Uh, and again, I'm reminded of that uh, this, the last two weeks with the conflict between the Israelis and the Palestinians. 
I had a friend uh, talk to me about uh, someone in her congregation uh, who uh, wrote her a really terse email for the language that was used because she's Jewish and she thought, she thought that the congregation, her congregation was siding with the Palestinians at the expense of Israelis. And it's, it's such a hard line, you know, where, you f where do you walk? I mean, you try to say something affirming of the suffering of the Palestinian people, then there is also the Jewish uh, feelings about anti-Semitism, which is real in our world today, and it's been real for a long time. So, so thinking of the stories that people tell, thinking of our ways of thinking of others, really makes a lot of sense. Are we living by stories that separate us? Are we living by stories that bring us together? Are we living in the pain of the past? Sometimes we can't let go of something that happened 30, 40, 60, 70 years before. And do we trust that anything is possible? Uh, this past week in the Bible study, we had a discussion. This was the study of, of the Gospel of Mark. Can we believe the unbelievable stuff of God? Sometimes, you know, we, we, we expect more of what had happened in the past, but God is often uh, beyond those limitations. But sometimes we just don't believe that potential. And so I hope today we'll have, we'll engage uh, in these uh, questions or thoughts of looking at which stories we live by. So I want to invite you to take a deep breath at this time and we, as we prepare our hearts for prayer. <coughs> God, we give you thanks for the gift of this day, for the gift of coming before you and uh, gathering together to worship, to open our hearts to you, to speak to us a word of life, a word of transformation, a word of healing for those places of brokenness, whether it's in our bodies or in our spirits. Help us, O oh God, to live by the wisdom of love. As challenging as it is in this world, at this moment in history, help us to be instruments of your love and peace. For we pray this in the way of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to tell you that the band had a different song to start with, but they uh, changed it at the last minute. And I'm thinking, you know, this song really fits because it's about finding our home in God. Uh, so, you know, maybe it was meant to be. So if you're feeling like you want to stand, go ahead and stand. If you have a tambourine anywhere in your vicinity, pick up your tambourine. This is an interactive <laughs> performance. <laughs>
Just know you're not alone. I'm gonna make this place Tambourines going. If I say something off, shake them. Say something good, shake them. <laughs> Today I uh, was thinking about this theme of the two stories we live by. I mean, there is there is a multitude of stories. When we look at life, there are uh, different stories for different parts of our lives, but there is usually a, a storyline that is going through our lives, through our world, and the dominant stories of our culture really impact that, whether you are looking at body image stories or you're looking at uh, success, how you define success, it is all influenced by the culture. It's kind of like the water. Uh, we drink every day and the air we breathe it's all around us and it's important to examine those because they become so entrenched in our own experience um, and so Mark Yacanali says this um, we are trained to live in a state of disconnection we are trained to live in fear and this is where you know looking at all the movies uh, Something happened during the pandemic, you know, where there, they tried to do these pandemic movies. I'm like, click, nope, not watching that. We're living this. No, nope, not interested. But it's interesting how many movies that, that there are about the end of the world or the apocalypse and whatever uh, is happening. And so he asked this question, are we meditating on these stories? Because we believe the only possible future is chaos, isolation, and death. And uh, there's this image that is just going to be so horrendous. And so uh, examining the images we live by, what are the images, uh, the moments, the stories on which your soul meditates? What are the stories that remind you to unlearn hatred and receive love? Uh, and think about the stories in your own life and why we uh, connect with certain people more than others. Uh, yesterday we celebrated Roxy's life and there were a story after story of affirming her spirit of giving and it was always about that sense of you know you need something I'll be there for you. She was always affirming not questioning not saying you know oh I don't know if uh, Paul is deserving of my time to go to the school. She just gave because she felt like it was a need to help others. So she lived by a story of giving. That was her story. And I would often say, you know, Roxy, you're doing too much. 
And she'd say, but I love it. That's how I grew up. That's what, that was what was instilled in me. And so she lived by those stories of connection, of bringing people together, of uh, coming together to, to, for the common good. But oftentimes, when you look at the culture, uh, there's these stories of hate, of fear. Somebody is not doing something they should, and therefore they are the enemy. Uh, and I'm not saying that we don't disagree with each other, but the way we vilify, the way we feel like the world is going to end if so-and-so comes into my space or into the government, it just becomes this kind of story we tell all the time that the world is ending. I thought of the movie, um, Sky, what, what is it, Stuart Little, and then the whole saying, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And then when the sky was really falling, I mean, it wasn't really falling, but what, pe what do people do? Believe him. It was just too much of the same thing. So we're always in that tense place. And um, this author, Ben Okri, he's a Nigerian author who has written a lot about story. He has a TED Talk, and we'll watch a video from it. He says, we live by stories. We also live in them. One way or another, we are living the stories planted in us early or along the way. Or we are also living the stories we planted knowingly or unknowingly in ourselves. We live stories that either give our lives meaning or negate, negate it with meaninglessness. If we, sh if we change the stories we live by, quite possibly we change our lives. And so thinking about that, what story are we living by? What do we tend to gravitate toward? And so we're going to watch his, uh, a clip from his uh, TED talk. There are two great stories that run our lives. The first is the public story that we tell about ourselves. This could take the form of the goals we want to achieve. It could take the form of the way in which we introduce and project ourselves to people. You may say, oh, I'm a poet, I'm a butcher, I'm a tailor. I like running, I like walking, I like taking photographs. I'm interested in books and I'm interested in libraries. That's one story, that's your public story. But there's another story, more powerful, sometimes more insidious, and I believe it's that story that is actually the deep shaper of our lives. I call it our secret story. It is a story that is embedded in our consciousness, embedded in our psyches, and the reason why it is a strange story, a difficult story, is because most of the time we are not even aware of it. It's almost as if we have this separate machinery of storytelling deep inside us. But we've embedded it there, one way or another. There are nations that say they're one kind of people, but actually things they do contradicts this public image that they give of themselves. There are nations that speak about fairness and justice, and yet their police force treat foreigners badly the first opportunity they get. There are individuals who want to, they want to write, they want to write, they want to write novels. They buy paper, they create a secret space for themselves, they do all the research, they sit down diligently every day to write. And yet, a year later, two years later, three years later, they haven't written what they set out to write. This secret story, I believe, either sabotages our public story or it strengthens it. Every one of us is wandering around with a secret story that we're not aware of. We may give the impression of being very confident, but when it comes to a crisis, it's that secret story, not the confident public story, it's the secret story that takes over. That's why sometimes individuals behave in ways that are contradictory to themselves. It's why nations sometimes surprise us with their deeds and their actions.
any reactions to this? Thoughts or you want to watch the whole thing? Yeah, you can find it on uh, YouTube, of course. This was in 2016. Mm. That when crisis happens, mm. you reach back to those stories to help you in crisis. Right, right. But sometimes it's that secret yeah. story that comes out. And sometimes, you know, people surprise us with their strengths. Like a crisis happens in their life, and they step up and they do things we never imagined them. It's like, what? How could this person be this kind of force in life? Yeah. Yes, Linda. Ah. Right. 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 So uh, the story of a young man who was adopted and uh, always feels disconnected, not wanted, and probably rejects people and doesn't connect with people because of that fear that he's never going to be loved for who he is. And so that story plays out over and over again. And a lot of times people are not aware that's what's really driving. Always does something to sabotage it. I can't tell you how many times I've seen this pattern in people, like people that want to have friends, but they do everything to not have friends. <laughs> people that it's like, well, if you could just quit this behavior, but, but it's not about the behavior, it's about the story. There's something inside that they have believed about themselves. You wanted to share something. Right. This is the way it is. This is who I am, and I have no choice. And you know what's interesting? I think when we began this uh, sermon series, we talked about our real true story of origin. Our origin didn't start here. It started in eternity, in God. I mean, this is we're here because somehow no matter what your belief system is, God has a purpose for us. And we're here to love the world in our own unique way. But we forget. We live in that story. And the medicine is to say, you know, what, what is the story that you're living by? Um, and, and you can't really, f I mean, this is the other side of it, is that you can't fix it just with intellectual power. You know how you say to yourself, oh, I'm, never gonna, I'm not going to be feeling ashamed next time this thing happens, or I'm not going to feel worried the next th time this thing happens. And how does that usually work out for you? It doesn't. You're just the same reaction. Or I'm not going to lash out when someone does this. Because the story is so embedded, it needs some deeper work. It needs spiritual work. It needs spiritual nurture. A lot, and sometimes it takes years to unlearn that story. I was um, actually the teacher of the workshop I'm going to next week. We've, I've, been, I've gone to two workshops before with her, and she was telling us about her internal story, that she was stupid, she would, never would amount to anything. And it took her a long time to, to realize that she could let go of that story. And it was a lot of spiritual work before she one day woke up and realized, remembered, hey, wait, I'm not saying this stuff to myself anymore. I'm not thinking these thoughts anymore about myself. Today our Bible story is about the choice of stories to believe in and live in. And so this is a story um, that you probably would skip over, but this is from the book of Acts, and it's the story of uh, Peter being released from prison through uh, divine intervention. So this is the story. The book of Acts is about the people of God after Jesus was gone from their midst and uh, they were continuing the mission of the church of, of Jesus. And so they, uh, there was harassment against the people of God. 
And so there was harassment against the disciples. Uh, one of them had been executed by Herod. And this was uh, the turn for Peter to be executed. So this was the night before he was supposed to be ex executed. He was in uh, prison. And the church had gathered to pray. So they were praying for his release. They were asking God to help that something would get him out because it was sure death the next morning. And so this is where the story uh, begins. And so Peter has an angel, releases him from prison, and he's having this kind of spiritual experiences. And here we get to verse 11. It was only then that Peter recovered his senses. Now I know, he said, that all of this is true, that our God really did send an angel to rescue me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people were so certain would happen to me. When Peter realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark. A number of people were gathered there praying. Peter knocked at the gateway door and an attendant named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was overjoyed that she raced back without opening it and then announced that Peter was at the gate. Have you ever done something like this? You're like, ah, I'm so excited. And so she couldn't believe it. I mean, they're sitting there praying for this, and Peter comes to them. And guess how the people respond? You are out of your mind, they said. But she kept insisting it was so. And I love that he's outside waiting while they're having this debate. Then, oh, it must be his angel, they said. Meanwhile, Peter continued to knock. When they opened the door and saw it was really him, they were amazed. I just love the whole story of this people just not believing something like this happening. It can't be. Have you ever had a sign from God and you're like, oh, I don't know. That doesn't sound right. Or a situation in your life that's really difficult or a relationship that's really difficult and you prayed for it, but then when someone is changing, and you're like, but could it be? Could it be happening? Are you out of your mind? Are you out of your mind? So what story did they live by? Think about the story they were living by. There was an execution. I mean, this was not, they were not imagining this, this persecution by Herod. This was not in their heads. This was really happening to them. Uh, so there, were, uh, there was an execution, and Peter was in prison. And even though they were praying for it, there was this story of fear. There was this story of fear all around them. And they really, and this is the guy, I mean, think about Peter, how important Peter was to the movement of Jesus. If you remember what Jesus called him, he was the rock upon which Christ was going to build the church. But here's the rock crumbling now in, in prison. Not going to happen. So a lot of their hopes were dashed. This was not what they expected. They were thinking, you know, okay, now we, you know, we are going to have the power of Christ with us, and nothing is going to touch us. But then things were touching them, and they were being persecuted. And, and the story of fear was so dominant around them. And so even though the good news of the gospel was so compelling for them, the fears of the world had a way of seeping into their human frailties, just like they do for us. And then they questioned. So what's the answer for all of this? Is to, to me, I mean, there are many different ways to take this story and to think about our personal stories. But think about the Rodas of the world, the servant, the slave girl that nobody would have paid attention to. She was kind of the, the giver of the good news. She was a, a person who proclaimed the good news. There's, there's Peter at the door. And not believing that. And that's reminiscent of what happened where? Where did, the, where did people not believe the women when they came and told good news? The resurrection. Yes, that happened again. People hearing the good news, and it's like, oh, Jesus was resurrected? That can't be right. These are idle tales. These women, what? they don't know what they're talking about. 
And sometimes we do that to ourselves. Sometimes we do it to other people that have hope for change in the world, that have energy and a different idea for what would happen. So if we change the stories we live by, if we change that inner subconscious or maybe sometimes it's conscious story of sabotaging ourselves, sabotaging others, if we change that, the world can really be a better place. And I, as I said, there are many ways to get there, but it's about getting out of that loop of fear and noticing within yourself, not judging, because that's easy to go to. Ah, oh, I'm never gonna amount to anything because I never learn anything from this, you know. It's not that, it's about noticing and asking for God's grace. And God always shows you a way. You just pay attention. And the answer could come to you in a very simple way. Last yesterday, uh, the answer came to me at the Wild Church. We were, where's Donna? Oh, Donna Blake. Okay, so she can attest. I'm telling the truth on this one. <laughs> so we get there. You know, I, you know, I'm worried about the time. There's the service for Roxy at one o'clock, and it was not the nicest day, weather-wise, to be outside. So we get there and the Blakes get there and then we're looking at each other. We're like, oh, it's, if it's the four of us, we're not doing it. <laughs> we're just, and, and David joked, he's like, I'll give you the readings and you could just go home and read them by yourselves. Okay, all right. And then a couple people showed up and then a couple more people showed up and we're like, oh, okay, good. fine, fine. All right, I guess we have to do it. Uh, and so we did it. And despite at first feeling cold, going up for a walk around Duet, uh, the pond there, it was just so powerful. I mean, saw so many messages from God for not being fearful, for not being in that anxious place. And it was just exactly what I needed for the day. I know for others it would have been probably different, but everyone had something that they encountered. Getting Bev, you were there too, and she brought a big blanket, a warm blanket. Um, you didn't know this backstory of how we were like, oh, oh no, Bev showed up now, we have to do it. <laughs> we never say that about you, but in that case, we were like, oh, and you know, it was just, so, so the busyness of the world could take precedent, could take, um, could take that place of what needs to happen spiritually. Taking that, you know, 45 minutes to really be centered was exactly what we all needed. And it was a, such a joyous experience despite the weather and the elements. But I, it's just, just one little example of that saying of what, what do we make room for in our lives? What stories do we allow to grow within our spirits? And that's kind of the challenge, is taking the time. Do you nurture relationships? Do you take the time to help somebody in need? Do you take the time to say, you know what, today I'm not gonna fill every moment with an, a task or a responsibility. Today I'm gonna take time to let my spirit breathe. I'm gonna take time to nurture a friendship. Uh, things that don't pay, that don't produce, that don't get rewarded by the culture around us or then don't make us consumers all the time. And so um, what helps you? What helps you to, to find that place of deeper stories of love? Peter. Peter, okay. I mean, he's screwed up so many times. Right. Jesus has told him he's going to build the church on him. Right. And the second sentence in this reading that you just read was, oh, and Gosh, now because he's released from prison, he knows it's real. Yeah. He didn't know it was real before. <laughs> I mean, he had Jesus with him. And, and it, yes. He in that situation. How can the rest of us not, not be in the same? And say, okay, God will give us another chance. Right. And God never gives up on us to say, you know, he, Peter had a hard time getting this message. It wasn't easy for him. And that, there's, there's a lot of grace in that for us. Because we tend to think, oh, you know, all the disciples, they all believed and they were just so good and they lived happily ever after. They didn't. They struggled like we do. They, they had to uh, go into that place of prayer. And even in their prayers, they weren't really believing. 
I mean, think about it. They're sitting there gathered for a prayer vigil, and they still didn't believe it was going to happen. And Peter himself, he had to come to his senses and say, wait, this really did happen. I wasn't imagining, you know, God did. The, the, the angel let me out of prison. It couldn't, it couldn't get any bigger than that, but that, that lack of belief, because there's a story underlying his life, and uh, the story is that of fear. Uh, any other thoughts, reactions to this? Yes? <laughs> so Henry Ford said that, whether, whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, either way you're right. It's true. It's, it's, it's not, I mean, there of course the circumstances around us dictate a lot, but also what we do, what we believe, how we, how we respond to the circumstances is our choice. Uh, you know, people who survive hardships, uh, all the studies show it's because they have some inner story of hope. And the people that don't have that inner story of hope, they, they can't withstand the pressures of life. And so it makes a difference what we think and what we believe. And um, today I want to invite us to, to uh, Lexio Divina practice, which is the reading of a scripture passage and listening to it uh, with the Holy Spirit speaking to us. And so the, the scripture is from John 16, 33. And so this is a time of fear for the disciples, and Jesus is telling them these words. I have said this to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world you face persecution, but take courage. I have conquered the world. And so uh, we'll listen to this three times. And it's okay if Archie or whatever kid is making noises in the nursery. You can just uh, call your attention back to the scripture. So we'll listen to it three times. And each time, we'll pay attention to a different part. So the first time, I'm going to invite you to pay attention to a word or a phrase that will connect with you. The second time, and I'll give you a little uh, pauses in between. The second time, I invite you to pay attention to a feeling that comes to you around your word or phrase. And then the third time, the invitation is to pay attention to a message that will speak to you uh, from God. Again, you don't need to manufacture this, but let, let the Holy Spirit uh, bring to your attention whatever needs to, to happen. So you may want to close your eyes for this part. You can leave them open if you're holding a baby. Uh, um, and so, listen to these words and so the first time we're listening for a word or a phrase that will connect with our spirits I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace in the world you face persecution but take courage I have conquered the world The second reading, this time paying attention to a feeling that arises around your word or phrase. I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you face persecution, but take courage, I have conquered the world. And now the third reading. Now paying attention to a, mes to a message for you from uh, the Spirit. 
related to your uh, word and feeling. I have said this to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you face persecution, but take courage, I have conquered the world. God, we give you thanks for these words, these stirrings in our hearts, inviting us to your story of love. Help us to trust. Help us to allow space in our hearts, in our daily lives, to always be grounded in your story of love. For we pray this in the way of Jesus Christ. Amen. So I thought for our uh, invitation to communion, if you want to just highlight any of the words that spoke to you, so we can just do this as popcorn. Courage, Courage. peace. Courage. think of these words um, speaking to us about the story behind this table. This is the story of this table. It is the story of redeeming uh, love, of redeeming humanity, of redeeming the conditions we create based on our fears. It is a story of peace, that everyone belongs at this table, that everyone is welcome, that everyone has something to contribute to this table, not just to receive from this table. All of us belong at this table because we are invited by the one who knows us, who knows us in the way we don't even know ourselves. A lot of times when I come to this table, I have to remind myself, you know, God loves you in ways you can never imagine or see in yourself. And that's okay, because even Peter didn't get it. And he still was welcomed at the table, and every time he was given the chance over and over again to experience that fullness of God's love and the grace of that, of that uh, experience of coming and being welcomed, uh, whether we think of the table of the prodigal father, sometimes we think of the prodigal son, but it's really the father that is full of wasteful grace that invites the son that was gone and wasteful but came back home and was welcomed at the table. Or whether we think of the two disciples who were so dismayed when they went uh, after the, uh, the events in Jerusalem and they were going back uh, to Emmaus and they encountered Jesus and didn't even recognize him. The table was the place where they recognized him. When they broke the bread and they took the cup, they realized, oh, that's the one we know. Courage, peace, that we know he has conquered the world. And the story is that of love that never ends. So today I invite you to come, whatever your story might be, that internal secret story, whether you have felt great success this week or felt great pain and shame and loss, whatever it is, you belong at this table. And I pray that it will speak to your heart, and that the Holy Spirit will stir you as you receive these gifts to feel that joy of being welcomed, welcomed home. And so let's take a moment to pray. God, we give you thanks for these words of encouragement, these words of faith that speak to our hearts about the truth of life. And we pray that you may bless these elements uh, that are before us, ordinary as they are, that they may be full of your grace and glory. Bless them that we may receive them as reminders of our belonging to you, that our story 
is in your love. Help us to remember that the love that Jesus showed is the love that we need today. For we pray this in his way. Amen. And we remember that on the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and after giving thanks to God, he gave it to them, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink from it, do this in remembrance of me. And the great news of our faith is that whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. And invitation is for you. We moved the table down, by the way. Last week we had a couple of incidents because the table was here and we dimmed the lights. Uh, so the invitation is for you to come up as you are able and take a piece of bread and you can dip it in the cup. I'll put the cup right here. Or you may take a cup and partake when you return to your seat. And this, is, uh, this bread is gluten-free if you need that option. Come for all is ready.
and we give thanks. God, we give you thanks for this feast of your love, for this experience of coming together as your people, whether using crutches or crawling on the floor, we're all in this together. Help us to remember that and to remember the story of love. We pray this in the way of Jesus Christ. Amen. Everybody knows this one, so if you'd like to stand, please feel free to stand and join us. But we know we'll hear you. <laughs> Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. some budding musicians right there. <laughs> and for the blessing, it, I invite you to take these words, especially as we think of our stories. The destiny of the world is determined less by the battles that are lost and won than by the stories it loves and believes in. And so go out telling your story of love and listen to each person's stories of love and healing. Choose wisely the stories you live by. And peace before you, peace behind you, peace above you, peace beneath you, peace at your right, peace at your left, peace within and all around you, this day and forevermore. 
Amen. Yes. Okay. You may be seated, I guess. <laughs> We're not finished. We have four more minutes. 